All right, let's go to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Now, we left off at a doctrinal application of what the author is trying to speak to the audience at verse 7, verse 7. So, the Word of God reads, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, so the verse is saying the earth, it takes in, it drinks the rain and the rain, what we see uh, throughout our world, it comes often, right? Here and there. That's what he's basically saying. When it comes on it, what happens is the result is and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. So in other words, uh, because of that rain, the earth is able to bring forth vegetation, uh, meat for them, as basically it fits well, it suits, it's made for the people where they can eat it. By whom it is dressed, in other words, that the vegetation that it was bringing forth for, it is, proper, it is appropriately prepared. It was dressed. So that's the idea. Dressed is the same word that you'll notice at Genesis 2, where it's referring to Adam taking care of the garden. So that word is referring to garden, vegetation, or plant, where people take care of it. And at the same time, the people receive that blessing from God himself, for he is the one who sends the rain when they eat that vegetation and life. Now, when Paul's saying this, Paul is actually referring to, and I'll explain it more, but the rain is supposed to represent the second advent. Mm -hmm. It is referring to when God comes down on this earth uh, at the end of the tribulation, and that is called the rain. Right. This rain will prove, basically Christ's coming will prove which one is the actual fruit and which one is the tares, the thorns. So continuing on, the verse reads, But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. The explanation for each and every word is meaning that contrary to the earth that bringeth forth the fruit, the vegetation, and life, that which bears bring forth thorns and briars instead, those things are rejected by God. Those things are considered to be very close to being cursed by him. Their end result is to be burned by God. Now, the verses to prove this. Let's start off with uh, Malachi 4, Malachi chapter 4. So all of this is referring to his uh, second coming. This is a second Advent passage. We will go to Malachi chapter 4, and then eventually we're going to go to Matthew 13, if you have time to go over there. And then if you have time to go there, go to Matthew 13. All right, I'm going to read Malachi 4, verse 1. The Bible says, For the day cometh, okay, there's a special day coming, that shall burn as an oven. Okay, there's a particular day where things will be burned. That kind of matches so far with Hebrews 6, right? The thorns and briars are burned. So we're wondering if it's referring to them. Keep reading. And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall ne leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness, Jesus Christ, arise with healing in his wings, and he shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, stall, and he shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be, notice, ashes under the sole of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Notice verse 5, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So that context is the coming of Christ. That is second advent. Now look at this, <coughs> verse 6, He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a what? Curse. Curse. Now that matches so far with Hebrews 6, you notice that, his second advent, because those things will be cursed by God when he comes. 
He's going to burn up the wicked. But you notice that he says those who serve the son of righteousness, they grow up as calves of the stall, kind of like fruit, right, coming out. Now, uh, compare this with Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Notice what Jesus says about the end of the world. Look at verse 24, Matthew 13, 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. See that? So notice that when the grass is growing, thorns, tares also come up. So it's hard to tell which one's the tear and which one's the wheat. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. So uh, notice right here that uh, God distinguishes those that could be raptured to heaven from the unbelievers that he binds and sets them apart for burning. Now, in the tribulation, the Jews will experience that. Let's go to Revelation 14. Revelation 14. Matthew 13 uh, is a side story where it's talking about the kingdom of heaven in its mystery form for the church age. But uh, that's not where I'm driving at. What I'm driving at right here is no, notice a similar scenario in Revelation 14. So this is all matching with the coming of Christ. That's the bottom line. When Jesus Christ comes, he's going to pr produce a rapture. And from this rapture, he wants to set apart those that are saved and those that are lost. So the tribulation, they will experience something like that. Now, do I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture? Yes, I do. That is for Christians in the church age, Amen. we will be raptured before the tribulation. Amen. However, in the tribulation, they also experience that. That's right. So that's what I'm focusing on is in the tribulation. There will be people who get saved in the tribulation, for some of you who didn't know. So obviously there's going to be people who will get saved in the tribulation. You can't get your loved ones saved right now, but after they see you get raptured, after they remember everything you told them from the Bible and they see that, that's a good chance for them, see? So they get to have their chance of salvation during the tribulation, and they will get their own rapture. Amen. Sometime in the end of the tribulation. Amen. Sometime in or at the end of the tribulation. Now, when we look at Revelation 14, look at this. Look at verse uh, 13. 14, 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Now, doesn't that sound similar? Do you remember deja vu a little bit from Hebrews chapter 4? Those who enter into his rest, and when they enter it, they rest from their works. Yes. Mm -hmm. So their labors are following them as well. That's why the verses labor to enter into his rest. Remember Hebrews 4? Okay, so this is all matching with Hebrews then. There's no doubt. Revelation 14 is matching up with Hebrews. Now keep reading. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Look at this. And another ca uh, angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. Uh, and another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress. And so, notice right here that there's two different groups when they're 
uh, harvesting. Notice that he's harvesting uh, this uh, one group with his sickle and taking them from the earth to heaven, right? Notice right here in verse 15, he reaped up. Uh, look at verse 16. The earth was reaped. See that? That means that, that those plants aren't in the earth. They've been reaped. They've been taken up. See, they have a rapture. But notice right here a second group at verse 18 through 20. This second group is intended for God's wrath upon them. See, that's why they get burned up. Now, this is all matching up with Hebrews. Go to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Remember that verse says they're nigh unto cursing? So look at right here, Matthew 25, the distinguishing of what you hear about the sheep and the goats. That has nothing to do with Christians. That is referring to tribulation. Right. It matches up with right here, distinguishing from the tares and then the wheat during the tribulation timeline. Amen. So look at Matthew chapter 25, Matthew 25. Notice in verse uh, 31, when the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. Okay, see, it's talking about the second advent, when Jesus Christ comes, correct? And before Him shall be gathered, see that, all nations, and He shall separate them one from another. See, He's distinguishing lost and saved, weed and tear, as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. That's where you get the idea. So people always try to make Christians doubt their salvation. Are you really God's sheep? Wow. You might be a fake sheep. You might be a goat. So you have to distinguish sheep and goat. No, there's no such thing. This is referring to tribulation timeline. That's right. That's right. Now, when you uh, keep reading right here, the verse says, uh, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Okay, so then you'll notice verse 34, then shall the king say unto them on the, his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Notice right here, they're able to enter God's kingdom in earth. So that's the millennial kingdom. You can easily guess that. Now remember Hebrews 4, what I talked about? They're trying to get their millennial inheritance. They're trying to get their reward of the promised land. That's earthly, their nation. They're trying, to get their, uh, they're trying to get their reward in the millennium. Now, continuing reading on, notice uh, when we skip down, look at uh, 41, 41, the goats, right? Mm -hmm. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye what? Cursed. Cursed into everlasting fire. Remember uh, Hebrews 6 warned, nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned? Cursed into everlasting fire, Matthew 25, 41. See, that matches. So this is no doubt referring to the second advent, after the tribulation. So that's why the author is telling, this is all tribulation doctrine. There's no doubt about it from what you see in the book of Hebrews. No way you see church age doctrine here. This is referring to end times, tribulation, what these saints have to go through, what, uh, what the Hebrews have to endure. Uh, the last one is Hosea 6. Hosea 6. Actually, there are, oh, I want to give you one more. Why not? James 5. So Hosea 6, James 5. Hosea 6, James 5. Now notice you have too many verses that evidence this is tribulation. This is second advent. This is not church age. If people try to pull up church age doctrine on you from these passages, they're wrong. There's no doubt this is second advent right here. There are way too many verses on this. Hosea is a book for Jews, right? Nation of Israel. So let's see what God says to the nation of Israel. Hosea 6.1, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us, the Jews. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us. See that? His coming... But when he comes as the what? Rain. rain, as a ladder and former rain unto the earth. Remember? Rain on the earth. Why did the author of Hebrews talk about the rain on the earth? Why would the author of Hebrews talk about that unless he knows what the Hebrews knew in their Hebrew Bible, Hosea, a Hebrew book? 
Here's another one. Uh, go to James 5. James 5. You know what James is written to? If you see James 1, 1, the 12 tribes of Israel. So that is Jewish. That's not Christian. So you hear so many times Christians pulling up James 2, faith without works is dead. You are justified by faith and works. That is all tribulation Jewish doctrine. That's not Christian. So look at tribulation Jewish doctrine. This is so plain when you look at James 5, 7. James 5, 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the what? Coming of the Lord, second advent. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. See, that matches with Revelation 14, that rapture. Uh, Hosea 6. And hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter what? Rain. Wait, didn't that match Hosea 6, early and latter rain? That's all Jewish. That's not Christian. Verse 8, be also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Now look at, uh, this is even more plain. Go to chapter 5, and then verse 3, chapter 5, verse 3. This is the sinners, the lost people. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were what? Fire, see the wicked get burned. That matches second coming again. God burns up the wicked and then raptures comes for the saved in, in the tribulation. By the way, James 5.3 I already told you the timeline. Ye have heaped treasure together for the church age. Is that what it said? No, no it says James 5.3 Ye have heaped treasure together for the what? Last, Last days. days. This is end times. Yeah. This is tribulation. All right. Let's go back to Hebrews. Hebrews. Now, I'm sorry to tell you is that this is the only Bible-believing church you'll ever get in this entire Bay Area who will teach you this doctrine. That's how bad it is. That's why dispensationalism is so needed. Now, there are plenty of Bible-believing churches like us all around the world, and I travel there, but you got to realize that uh, when it comes to, uh, as we get closer and closer to the end, it's not going to be the majority of Christianity that's going to be in the right. The majority will always be wrong, right? Always minority. So that's really sad that this is the only Bible-believing church in the entire Bay Area. You might come to churches who are independent fundamental Baptists by denomination like us, who are King James only like us, but they don't know this much dispensationalism, which is unfortunate. They try to apply everything to the Christian church. All right, go to Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6. That's why this doctrine is so important. I keep urging you to know this doctrine. All right, verse 9. But, uh, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Okay, in other words, the author is saying that, however, beloved, he's speaking to his Hebrew people that, you know, I'm convinced, I'm persuaded better things of you. So you're not going to be like those wicked people whose end is burned up. You're going to be the fruit that comes out. The fruit that what? The fruit that, remember, at verse uh, 4 through 6, those who don't fall away, those who endure to the end, those who uh, knew the basic doctrines, the foundations, and keep going on to perfection. Remember that? That was a context. He's saying, I'm persuaded bare things of you. Concerning what? Concerning those that accompany salvation. See, those are the things that accompany salvation, which, again, those foundations. Chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. That's what the things that accompany salvation is referring to. So, the what? Principles of the doctrine of Christ, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith toward God, Baptism, seven baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. So he's persuaded that they know this, that they major in this, that they live in this, and they're growing up in this. That they're moving, that they're, they're finally going on to perfection. Verse 3, remember, let us go on to perfection after listing all those foundations. So he's saying that uh, after you got saved, these things that accompany your salvation, I'm persuaded that you're going to maintain this. This is the stuff that I'm 
speaking to you about. At verse 9, he's saying, though we thus speak. So he, in other words, he's saying, I'm persuaded that you already have that, even though I'm speaking ab about this to you, all right? Even though I'm telling you about this. Verse 10, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Okay, let me summarize verse 10 through 11. See if my explanation match up every word. Because like I told you, look at the Bible. And don't look at me like a tree full of owls and then just nod your head. All right, I could be lying to you. All right. You got to look at the Bible and see if uh, my teaching will match up with that book. That book is the final authority, not yours truly. All right. Verse 10 and 11. The idea is the Apostle Paul is arguing. I'm persuaded. Remember the context. Verse 9. I'm persuaded that all these things will accompany you because God, uh, based on the reason why I know that you'll keep on with this, is because keep in mind that God is never unrighteous. He's never uh, evil. He's never mean where he's going to forget all the work and the labor that you did for him out of love because you love him so much and you did this much labor and work for him. This work that you've done, it was, uh, you showed it uh, toward his name. You showed it for his name's sake, toward him. What kind of work did they show forth? By ministering to fellow brethren, the saints. And also, they keep ministering. Not just saints, but they minister to people around them. They minister in general. So Paul says, that's why I desire that every one of you will show what? This same diligent effort where you're ministering to each other where you're moving on to perfection from these foundation. Notice, till when? To the end. Now remember that wording, to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Isn't that a little deja vu, remember? That phrase in Hebrews 3, go to Hebrews 3. Hebrews chapter 3. What does it mean by full assurance, hope to the end? Those three words. It matches basically the idea of referring to your salvation and rapture. That's what it's referring to. It's referring to your salvation and rapture. So you got to keep doing this up to the tribulation, till the end of the tribulation. So look at Hebrews chapter 3. Uh, recall that uh, this was explained to you before when we look at verse 14, 14. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our, look at this, confidence steadfast unto the end. See that? It matches with full assurance of hope to the end. Uh, we see that uh, repeated again several times throughout the scriptures, that phrase, hope unto the end, confidence steadfast unto the end, and uh, other places in the book of Hebrew. So that's one example right there at Hebrews chapter 3. I think another one is Hebrews 2. Let me try to find that one real briefly. 2-6. Uh, 3-6. Uh, thank you. That, that's better. Thank you. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. See that? So that's all the same idea. But notice this holding fast, right? Enduring. That's the idea where Christians falsely talk about endure to the end for your salvation and you might make it to the rapture. Hey, wrong time period, fella. That's for tribulation. Yeah. That's for tribulation. So notice that this all matches up together. All right, uh, let's go back. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 6. And then verse 10 through 11. Now, uh, remember, in, when we study the Word of God, we're not supposed to only take a doctrinal application, okay? Now, hyper-dispensationalists, uh, they're a wrong group. They teach heresy, okay? So we'll call them hypers. The hypers, they only focus on this, okay? That's their problem. 
Because they only focus so much on doctrine, 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 they assume that that is a tribulation Jewish application, and a Christian hence cannot take a blessing or claim any of the promises or blessings from the book of Hebrews. That's not true. Remember, uh, as Bible believers, we take a threefold application. Threefold application. Now, not all hypers are this. They'll probably agree with the three. Some hypers might agree with the threefold application like us, but then there are other hypers who don't. So I'm debunking those guys. We believe in a threefold application. In other words, this is a Bible verse. You all see that down there? All right. I think the this. Uh, I think people can see that, right? That this thing's not blocking. Yeah, yeah, they can see. Okay. So this is a Bible verse. When we look at a Bible verse, uh, Christian. Uh, I won't say a bad word, okay? So just Christian, uh, we, uh, what did I say? Christian babies, you know? Yeah. I'll just say it. Christian idiots, okay? Christian idiots, okay? Max made me say it, all right? Don't get mad at me. It was Max, all right? Christian idiots nowadays, they just look at a Bible verse and then interpret it. That's it. You, can, <laughs> you cannot do that. That's not how it's done. In a Bible verse, you have to have a threefold application in mind. There's a historical background to the Bible verse that you've got to understand so you can get a better idea. A second one is there's a doctrinal, a.k.a. prophetic application. Right. And then there's an application where anyone can take it spiritually for themselves or devotionally, apply it to themselves. They can, get, they can learn a personal lesson from it. So that's a spiritual application. Can't you see from Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10 through 11, how this uh, really, or maybe even 9 as well, 9 through 11, how this can be really a good spiritual application to a Christian? When you read verse 9 through 11, all right, let's be honest. When you read verse 9 through 11, that seems a lot more Christian than tribulation Jew, right? You see that right there, except probably the last part of verse 11, you know, full assurance of hope unto the end. But besides verse 11, if you do 9 and 10, that can fit well to a Christian. Mm -hmm. So you notice right here, after you get saved, Paul is confident that uh, the things that accompany salvation. Yeah. Now, there are many things that accompany our salvation that we try to live under, right? There are many blessings or things that God has given to us after salvation that we're trying to live for. And because of those work and efforts of ours, verse 10, it's important for you to keep in mind God won't be unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. Uh, so uh, uh, she's, she'll probably hate me for saying this, but that's my, one of my wife's favorite verses. She posts it on her refrigerator. And actually, this is one of my favorite verses, not because that she's my wife, all right? <laughs> all right? But because it, it does have a lot of meaning to me. Because in our minds, it is very easy for us in our work and our labors to think of unfairness, and it's hard to go by faith quite often. But you have to uh, believe in this uh, wicked world that we live in, and there are times that you might be in trap scenarios or in uh, very wicked places or trying times, and you will question God. You will get bitter like Job and uh, Jeremiah did. Yeah. Yeah. And the devil will attack you hard. But you have to remember that uh, God is not evil when all these bad things happen. Well, our, my works are not remembered. No, God is not unrighteous to forget Amen. your work and labor of love. That's a very important verse that will help you immensely during such trying times. So, uh, uh, in my uh, philosophical, secular mindset, I could probably, I do believe there is a God, there's no doubt about it, but then I question, like the atheist, on his morality, see, his goodness. Atheists don't believe that God exists because of so much suffering in the world, so he's immoral, God is unfair. To me, in my mind, that's a weak argument against the existence of God. God could be evil and still exist himself. There is such a thing as evil gods, right, in our Bible, and those are the lower gods. So that doesn't disprove the existence of God. But in my mind, now I'm wondering, is, that, is, it, is it really a just God, a good God? The only thing that I could bet on is his word right here, yeah. his promise right here. 
I can argue for a lot of the good things that he did in my life. I can argue for a lot of uh, bad things and sufferings I went through that he turned for good. But, you know, human flesh is still flesh. And then uh, it will all, always argue, especially if you're a person who lived your Christian life for years and the devil attacks you hard, and then uh, God really doesn't seem to meet you, that it, the doubt seeps in and then bitterness seeps in, and then you question God's goodness. That comes in very easily. So then this verse is so important for you. that No, we don't serve an evil God. We do serve a gracious, good God. Why? Because he won't forget your work and labor of love, even though you think he does. What will disprove you wrong is the judgment seat of Christ. That, so you could try to prove God wrong all the time right now, but the end is where it's going to prove everything that you're wrong. Judgment seat of Christ, God remembered everything that you did that you forgot. You will even forget your work and labor of love. You know that? But God did it. And he'll remind you at the judgment seat of Christ. So that's a wonderful verse. That's a wonderful promise that you should keep in mind. So let's think of the most extreme example, Job, all right? Go to the last chapter of Job. Go to the last chapter of Job. Perhaps the most extreme example of the unjustness and the unfairness with God would be how he afflicted Job's life. I believe that's why the Lord added the book of Job in your Bible. Because notice that God did not forget Job. See that? He did not forget his work and labor of love. So when he blessed him, he blessed him double. He didn't just bless him for the sacrifices. He didn't just bless him fairly, even though you think he's unfair. No, God will be fair when he blesses you. He'll be fair when he rewards you. But guess what? He'll be more than fair. He might double it. He might increase it. That's the kind of God you got. Uh, exam uh, haven't you seen that in your life? How God has blessed you more than what you deserve, you and I deserve. Now, when you look at Job chapter 42, Job chapter 42, look at verse 10, verse 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. All right, so God is not unjust at the end. At the beginning, Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, you can see him as unjust. But then at the end, you'll see that he is not. He is not. All right, go back to uh, Hebrews. It's a great verse to memorize for saved Christians. You can be a hyper and say, well, that's for a tribulation Jew. No, no, no. As a Christian, I like to claim this promise from me. All right, I'll take that one. All right, go to the book of Hebrews chapter 6. We'll look at verse 12. The Bible says that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. <coughs> so the Apostle Paul writes that, uh, remember, he's saying that he desires that all of them will keep up this good work to the end, that they won't be slothful, that they won't be lazy, that they'll fall behind, but that they will actually follow like the saints of old, who also had a lot of faith and went through a lot of patience to get the promise of God, to gain their inheritance that God promised them. So since the author is speaking to the Hebrews, you can easily guess this is referring to their Hebrew forefathers. And the greatest example is Hebrews 11. See, Hebrews 11, he gives the heroes of faith to these Jews. Heroes of faith and patience. See, the heroes of faith and patience. Like he said in Hebrews 6, 12, who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So notice verse 4, he talks about by faith Abel, right? <coughs> verse 5, by faith Enoch. Verse 7, by faith Noah. Verse 8, by faith Abraham. And then uh, notice verse 9, Isaac, Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. See, God gave them a promise. Verse 11, Sarah, you go all the way down to uh, the end, verse 32. And what shall I more say for the time would fail to tell me of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jeth, uh, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets. Uh, verse 39, and these all having obtained a good report through faith, receive not the promise 
God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Okay, so in other words right here, he points out at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12, these forefathers of old, through much uh, faith and patience, they were able to inherit, they were able to gain the promise. But the thing is, in Hebrews 11, verse 39, they did not receive the promise. What does that mean, even though after they died? The idea is this, they did attain, they did receive the promise till the end of their life when they died. Yeah. But they weren't able to get it completely. Yeah. All right, it's still incomplete. All right, they were able to achieve it and get it. And God's like, okay, good, you got it. But I can't give you the full thing yet until I come again. See, that's why the context is his advent, right? His coming. When he comes, then his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is fulfilled. All right? It's still ongoing. That's the idea. His promise is still ongoing. It's not completed. It's not Amen. done yet. It's not fulfilled. Until he comes and the end is over, then it's fulfilled. The Jews be able to get, gain their full millennial inheritance. So the promises right here in uh, Hebrews 6.12 is referring to the inheritance at the millennium for the Jews. The promises for them. But uh, here's the thing, though. When we come to verse 13, we can see that it could be a double application then. If we look at verse 13, for, God, for when God <laughs> made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And then he talks, uh, well... Why not read the whole thing, okay? And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. Okay, I'll explain each and every word later, but the point is in verse 13 through 17, uh, the author of Hebrews is arguing to his Hebrew audience, that Abraham is an example. God gave a promise to him, and because you're from his seed, you're heirs of the promise as well. So uh, God will bestow the millennial inheritance to the Hebrews because of what he swore to Abraham. However, the thing is, with Abraham's seed, it's not just a physical line called the Jews. All right, You'll notice right here that Abraham's seed has a physical line, Jews, which is a millennial inheritance. But there's a second line here Come on. that is spiritual. That is the Christian church. And our inheritance is obviously not earthly, all right? Amen. Our inheritance is heavenly. Woo. The Jews, because they're physical, they're earthly, right? Their physical line, bloodline, physical seed, earthly seed of Abraham, they get that earthly inheritance, the millennial inheritance, when God rules over the world. Our inheritance is a millennium. Now, the evidence to prove this double seed of Abraham, that uh, people who hate dispensationalism and then accuse me for saying they're just making stuff up. No, you don't. You, they never read Romans 4. Look at Romans 4, all right? Romans chapter 4. Notice right here that the seed of Abraham consists of a physical bloodline Jews, but also a spiritual line, which is saved believers in Jesus Christ, Amen. the church. Amen. Now look at Romans chapter 4. Notice at verse 16. Therefore it is of faith. That's us, right? We got saved by faith. That it might be by grace. That's us, right? Saved by grace through faith. Not like the Hebrews who have to work, right, for salvation. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. Oh, how about that? So that Abraham, and this is what? Abraham, the context is verse 13. Abraham, verse 13. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Ah, so notice right here, this is the Abrahamic seed who is the heir of the world who gained the promise. See that? So we're the ones who gained the promise. Now, go back to Romans 4.16, all right? 4.16. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. That's us, right? Saved by grace through faith, the spiritual seed. Not to that only which is of the law, 
but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now, did you read that? So notice that Abraham is the fathers of the Jews who are under the law, mm -hmm. as well as those who are of faith. Amen. See? So notice right here, there is a double seed of Abraham right here. There is a double seed of Abraham. Now, uh, I know that before when we read, was it uh, verse 13? Some anti-dispensationalists will use this to prove that it's not Jews under the law who are heirs of the promise. It's only those who are by faith. But the problem is this. Paul is arguing to Jews in the church age. See that? If Jews in the church age during his time, they want to get saved by the law, nah, -uh. you have to believe by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But what about Jews under the law during the tribulation? See, that's different. Yeah. So that's why verse 16, how are you going to go around verse 16? Right. See, because Abraham's the father of those of the law and of faith. Right. So see, you can't get around verse 16. So we see right here the Abraham seed, it consists of two lines, physical Jew, which is the millennial inheritance, and a spiritual seed, which is the church heavenly inheritance. Now, here's the fun part. You ready? All right, go back to Hebrews 6. Now we go over here. Uh, this dimensional teaching, you all remember that? Yeah, that was good. You remember that your pastor was the one who founded this teaching and it was all his <laughs> idea. So I told that pastor during the conference meeting to teach that lesson, all right? So yeah, it was all my idea, all right? Go to, go to Hebrews chapter 6, all right? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 6. All right. This is groundbreaking what Pastor Chad Reese did on the dimensional teaching. Uh, I'll explain a little bit of that, but he, he will explain it a lot better because obviously he founded it, all right? So... Uh, if some people are curious, you can go to our Iron Sharpeneth Iron Conference meeting, and then you'll see Pastor Chad Reese teaching, and it is very groundbreaking and eye-opening. So eye-opening that nobody had a question, except this idiot right here. I was like, ah, 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 ah. Okay, so. But this is going to be very important, which will be very helpful. Okay, let me show you how this works, all right? The dimensional application. Now, it's going to start this way, which is easier. Okay, however, the author's background is very hard to figure out quite often. So in reality, it's going to be dimensional. Okay, you start out with dimensional. When you start out with dimensional, then the triple application is more filtered out. When it's filtered out, then you can find the proper Bible verse. Okay, so let me repeat again. Dimensional, and then it could go through these three lines either way. And then you'll get the right interpretation of the Bible verse, all right? Later on, I'll show you the, why the author's background will be first later on, okay? And that way it'll become more clear. But to be quite honest, you don't get the author's background until you do this first, okay? This is foundation. Dimensional, in my opinion, is foundational, The triple application will be a second foundation, in my opinion. That's my opinion. But um, it is possible that these two could probably go together, all right? So if what I say is heresy, then at least these two can go together, okay? But the dimensional application is as follows. The idea is, depending what timeline or dimension you're in, when you look at that verse, you're going to interpret it according to your timeline, according to your dimension. Okay, here's a, a one good example that uh, all of us know, all right? So when we look at uh, Hebrews 9.27, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Yeah. Now, that verse is Hebrew Jewish tribulation, Hebrews 9.27, all right? But as a Christian, when I look at that verse, that verse can doctrinally apply to me. Yeah. You might say, why? Because in my timeline, everybody dies once, and after that, there's a judgment. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. See that? A, tribula a Jew in the tribulation, when he reads that, it will be the same thing. Yeah. It will be the same thing that according to his dimension, his timeline, look, we're all going to die and you're only going to die once. There's no such thing as second, third, or triple deaths. But after this, I'm going to be judged by God. Yes. Here's another example. Another example is like um, when we look at 
other verses, and he pointed out being born again. Pastor Chad Reese talked about being born again at John chapter 3. Hypers, they want to apply that to Israel, okay, the new birth. They try to apply that to Israel, and they'll try to apply that to the national restoration at the future tribulation, which is true. In John 3, 3, when Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus, a Jew, he must be born again. This was referring to the nation of Israel. But me as a Christian, when I read that, I'm not thinking about my nation being restored. My nation ain't going to be, going to be restored. America's going down the hole, all right? Yeah. So when I read John 3, 3, he must be born again, what does that mean to me? In my dimension when I'm reading it, it means that I must receive Christ for my salvation yes. so that I can receive the new birth. That's right. So notice right here, Jesus Christ, when he used that verse, it could apply, uh, it can apply doctrinally to Christians in one way, yes. but it can also apply doctrinally to the Jew in a, another way. Right. Right. See that? Yes. Uh, that's very eye-opening. When you see it that way, a person, when they read the verse in their dimension, it will be taken as something else, it'll be taken as something helpful. Another example is uh, when you look at other verses in the Bible, like 1 John, for example, all right? Um, no, let's do Hebrews. That'll be better, okay? So let's go to Hebrews now, okay? And then get this idea. So think about this. Hebrews 6.10. Can't a Christian doctrinally, Hebrews 6.10, can't a Christian doctrinally apply that verse to himself? Yeah. That God will not be unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love? Yeah, that doctrine works. Yeah. So a Christian can take that verse for himself. But remember, can a tribulation Jew also do that? Yes, because they have to work and you're to the end for their salvation. Yeah. See that? So it depends on their dimension. To us in the church age, no matter how bad life is or how unfair it is, or how, uh, we got to believe that God will always be good to us. He's not unrighteous. Amen. To a tribulation Jew, when they're reading it, they've got to believe that the Antichrist is not God and that the God of the Bible that I'm reading, that he is not unrighteous. He will reward me. So I got to believe in that no matter what and resist the mark of the beast and just keep laboring on for him. See that? In their dimensions, they're thinking differently. Yeah. Amen. So you start out with dimension. So every verse, this is the best thing to do it, okay? Dispensationalism divides, okay? divides verses to different people to different time periods. Right. But hyper-dispensationalists, this is important, they start out with dispensationalism when they read the verse, which I believe is wrong. Okay, let me repeat that again, all right? I'm not speaking heresy, but just give me a break, okay? When you start out in reading a verse, you don't start out reading dispensationally. You might say, why is that? Because if you do that, then it'll be easy to separate verses from you. So this verse don't apply to me, this verse don't apply to me, and you're going to reject, you're going to reject, you're going to reject. You should start out dimensionally. That's good. If you start out dimensionally, you can see how that verse can apply to you. Well, what if that verse doesn't, uh, what if I try to take that verse and it cannot apply to me then, yeah. right? So then the dimension is switches, see that? Yeah. So it switches now where you got to go by this application here. Yeah. This is where dispensationalism comes in. So when I read that verse, as it says, endure unto the end for my salvation, I don't care how dimensional you are, you know, that just don't sound right, okay? So then, maybe I could apply it spiritually, right? You know, so then, you know, just do the, uh, just serve the Lord Jesus Christ as best as I can to the end, but it's my salvation still is at stake here, so that's a problem. So, right here, this is where doctrinal comes in, right? So dispensationalism comes in. Dispensationalism is part of doctrine. So dispensationalism demands that you have to divide that verse to the right group of people, the right time period. Yeah. By doing that, then, ah, that will be for the tribulation Jew, not for me. Yeah. If, there is, if you can take that verse somehow spiritually for yourself, then have at it. The greatest example is preaching, Sunday preaching. In Sunday preaching, I actually used Hebrews chapter 
uh, 6 and verse 9. For some of you who don't remember that. But when I preached about uh, sanctification, body, soul, spirit, you might remember that. I used Hebrews 6, 9 and then uh, verse uh, 18 through 20. I used that. But that was used as a spiritual application. I was ignoring the doctrinal part right here. See that? So, the historical is, when you look at a Bible verse, see what the historical background is. <clears throat> when you look at a Bible verse, see if you can find a spiritual lesson out of that. When you take a Bible verse, see if it's not just restricted to a historical timeline, but if it's doctrinally talking about something else, or if it's a prophecy about the future. So that's what you do with the Bible verse. But you start out dimensionally first. When you start out dimensionally, see how you can take that verse applying to you, literally and doctrinally, yes, truthfully to you. But if the word, when you read it as exactly as it says, where it's impossible to apply it to your dimension, then you filter it through this triple application method. See that? Historical, doctrinal, prophetic, and spiritual. So I don't know if some of you caught that during my questioning with Pastor Reese that time at Bible study. Sometimes I, I'm in my own world, so I'm lost in a deep thought, and then some people might be going, what is Pastor talking about right here? But it's because of all this. So I, now that I draw it out, you see what was going on in my mind? It was like a eureka moment for me. Because I only concentrated triple application. But this dimensional thing is exactly what I needed. That explained the triple application more clearly, which explained the author's background more clearly. Yeah. Now, I never said dimensional, but the author's background, you notice how this match, matches up yeah. dimensionally right here? That's good. All right. The author's background. How did I come to these three conclusions? Because I didn't have the word for it, but it was in my unconscious mind, according to Carl Jung, the unconscious mind. It was called dimensional. It was swimming in my unconscious mind. I knew it. I knew it. Before Pastor Chad Reeks, I knew it in my unconscious mind. <laughs> but he's the one that came out dimensionally, all right? One thing I learned is when you think that you're the one who found the doctrine, yeah. trust me, I've talked to too many Bible believers out there. There are so many of them out there who found it as well. What happens when you study that book? Yeah. You got the same spirit and it leads you to the right conclusions together. You'd be surprised. Yeah, right. It does that. Yeah. All right. But anyway, um, so how do these three conclusions happen is because first dimensionally. See that when you first have a dimensional application and then the triple application after that. You better, then what happens is you have a better understanding why the, uh, what's going on with the author, why he wrote it. Yeah, so then, hence, we get the author's background. Yeah. All right, what was going on his, in his mind when he was writing? But you start out dimensionally first. Then you filter it through a triple application to the, interpret the verse. Yeah. Then from there, you can make guesswork what the author's intention was. All right? Now, this is the problem with majority of Bible expositors, okay? They start out trying to know the author's background first. They only pick a historical application first. Yeah. In English majors, how we interpret liter literary works, no matter how abstract it is, is, which is very powerful, you know the author's background. You study the historical time period, which is very, very true, but that limits you because you're only studying the, the human author, and his human time period. You're not looking at the eternal time period of the real author, which is God, who intended it for uh, his Bible to be read by everybody of all time periods, not just one historical time period restricted by one human author of that time period. See that? So that's the reason why the scholars are wrong. All right? They're right about knowing the author's background, that it is salient in any work. All right. You got to know the historical background, too. It is necessary in every work. OK. So that helps you interpret materials that you read, articles that you read. However, that is very, very restricted because they're humanist scholars. So they think it's a humanist author, humanist uh, material they're writing. See, so when a Bible believer starts Bible, God's mind, they understand God's mind more. 
And by understanding that, they, that's how they come up with these applications. See that? Dimensional, historical, doctrinal, prophetic, and spiritual. All right, now, anyway, let's come to the author's background. Then all of this is going to make sense. You ready? Then we can guess the author's background right here. What was going on in his mind when he was writing? Let me repeat again, right? What you remember in a Hebrews class. The author, uh, the author Paul, <coughs> he was writing tribulation doctrine to Jews during a time period that was transitional. This was transitional before the church age doctrine. Paul was able to officially give it to Gentiles. It was during his time in Arabia at the desert. Remember, it took him years to get church age doctrine. For you and I, we might get it down in six months or a year. Yeah. Why is it easy for us, but Paul, it took a long time? Because it was new. Yeah. Paul, who's a Jew, yeah. and Jews who are used to hearing about their messianic kingdom, the Messiah coming, his second advent, tribulation end times, that's a doctrine Paul knew more easily, yeah. understood better. But now to talk about salvation not by works, but by faith, which is unheard of to Jews because they always live by the works of the law combined with their faith. See, that's totally new. See? So uh, for Paul, he had an understanding of tribulation doctrine for the Jews. The evidence is the book of Hebrews says Hebrews, and it says so many times, the end, the end, the end, the end, the end. And there are way too many verses that just match with Old Testament verses and other verses about the tribulation, not church age. There's no doubt about it. So he wrote it during a transitional time period where it was going Jew to Gentile, but it was still dealing with Jews. Gentiles were gradually getting in. Now, that is his background, or uh, which can it also explain why there's little bit of Christian doctrine mingled in Hebrew. See that? Mm -hmm. That also explains that because he's being introduced that. It's introduced to him. But mainly he's Jewish, tribulation and knowledge. Second one is this. To Paul, it's tribulation doctrine when he's writing all of Hebrews. Yeah. But to God's mind, he's saying, no, this is actually going to be to the church, but you don't know that yet. A great example is the Old Testament prophets, right? When they were writing about the Messiah, they had no idea what they're talking about. Uh, they thought they were talking about themselves or their nation or somebody. But God knew it applied to Jesus Christ. Right. See, so it's the same thing, all right? Authors, a lot of times, they just write to their understanding best as they could. But God sees it as something else, okay? All right, third thing is Paul, he sees it as tribulation doctrine when he's writing the verse. But God could see it. No, I see it as... This verse can work for church, and it can also work for tribulation. So whenever you see a verse in the book of Hebrews, it could go in one of these two, three steps. That's what's going on in the mind of the authors when he's writing, okay? It's one of these three points whenever he's writing a certain verse. This makes a lot of sense, and it balances out See, now, dimensionally, now this will make sense more. So we started out dimensionally, triple application, then guess the author's background. Now we repeat again, starting with the author's background. Now let's see if dimensionally, triple application will be even more clear. Okay, so let's take Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 6, uh, 10, as well as verse 12, through 20, okay, that, or 12 through 17 that I read, all right? We can see that it can definite, definitely apply to Christian and tribulation, those following verses, all right? So let's do it this way, okay? We understand the author's background, what he's doing, okay? Now let's go dimensionally right here, okay? Dimensionally, Hebrews, uh, in that verse, God is not unrighteous to forget your work, labor of love. You are Abraham's seed, so you will inherit the promise, okay? So, in that verse, Paul could be writing in this manner, where he thinks it's, uh, where it's for tribulation Jews and during a transitional time, or it could be that God says, no, I think that it can apply to church, even though you think it's tribulation. Or this, which I think this is the, the better answer, Paul thinks it's tribulation, but God says, no, actually it can work for either or. Yeah. 
because depending on this transitional time period, we'll see what will happen. See, so if the Jews turn out they accept their Messiah, they get saved, then they can undergo the tribulation, the rapture, and then the Antichrist can come. But if the Jews reject it, it can go to Gentile, so it'll work with the church. So either or, it'll work, Paul, whatever way you write. Amen. See that? So, notice dimensionally then, see that? If God applies it to church and tribulation, dimensionally, when a church which is us, look at Hebrews 9 and those following verses. God is not unrighteous to forget your work, labor of love, your Abraham seed, you're going to inherit it. In our eyes, this works doctrinally to us. It also works spiritually to us. And maybe even historically, because remember, the author is writing during a transitional time period. So he's being introduced Christian doctrine. See that? So you notice how I filter that? And hence, we get the right interpretation for this verse. And obviously, spiritually, you can interpret it however way you want. Now, let's see right here, tribulation, all right? In point number three, let's say this is the likely answer. So to a tribulation saint, notice right here, it's tribulation to Paul, but God applies it to both church and tribulation. Well, to church is to church, but notice right here, tribulation to Paul, and God sees that it can apply to tribulation. So dimensionally speaking, a tribulation saint could see that. So a tribulation saint could be reading that verse, God is not unrighteous to forget your work, labor of love, your Abraham seed. So that tribulation Jew in his dimension, when he's reading that, as the author's background is, I'm writing this for tribulation Jews. And God says, yeah, that can work for tribulation Jew too in the background. The tribulation Jew in his dimension, hence, can apply it to himself and see a doctrinal application with that Bible verse. He can see that historically as well because Paul was writing it during a timeline for tribulation Jews. That was his intention. And spiritually, he can apply it to however way you want. So how, how can you be this, just this? Does that make sense? See, you cannot be a hyper-dispensationalist. That is just awful. Awful, shoddy biblical hermeneutics, you got to realize. Hyper they're looking at a very small picture. Notice this full picture right here. This is the full picture of what's going on. Hyper dispensationalists, they'll see it as doctrinally tribulation Jew. So Paul was intending it to write it to tribulation Jews. That's what he was intending and all that. But then when you look at other verses in the Bible, there's no doubt it matches with Pauline epistles, Christian epistles. So what do hypers do about that? They don't care. They just separate it. They just divide it. They forget the, the transitional time period. See, they think that Paul was only writing to tribulation Jews. How do you not know that Paul, when he was writing it to tribulation Jews, he was being introduced by God, that church age doctrine, and then Paul was writing it as if it was tribulation to Jew, but God's like, no, well, this is going to be church, but, you know, this can work for tribulation Jew as well. All right, see, they don't know the full story. They only look at a small little picture from a bigger picture right here. All right, now, this will be extremely helpful in your biblical interpretation. I'm done. All right, sorry, I can't continue on. All right. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. Open our eyes more to understanding your scripture. Your book is such an incredible book. Help us to keep gleaning, growing, and learning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.